Big Ben with BTS Photography bringing you another exciting post-processing tutorial taking you into my workflow on how I edit uh, some of my images. Today we're going to be looking at some nitty-gritty uh, photos for a commercial campaign I did for a firearm company, Red Rock Precision. Uh, they specialize in extreme long-range hunting rifles, uh, rifles that range to shooting at 1,200 yards. Uh, this is a campaign that will be launching here pretty soon and I am happy to show you how I got this edgy look uh, without going into HDR photography. Uh, we're going to be using Lightroom 4 as well as Photoshop CS6. I'm working on the Windows platform and just as we get started here uh, you can see this is uh, one of our potential final images that we have used uh, for the campaign that will probably be uh, airing in or should I say being shown in several magazines so without further ado uh, let's get started uh, we'll go ahead and jump in here into my directory uh, with my actual raw photos uh, these were shot simply with a two light setup with a Nikon D800 and Ellen Crom Ranger Quadras uh, this was a very overcast day extremely cold probably about 20 degrees outside and uh, we simply had a two light setup uh, with a strip box on one side for edge light and a smaller soft box uh, frame right uh, used as a fill light uh, just to kind of give a little bit of fill to the face. Uh, the wind was blowing really hard that day so I didn't have the options to go with an umbrella and so we did have to go with the soft box which in the end since it was a smaller apparent light source gave us a little bit more harder light. So you can see this is our image straight out of the camera. Uh, looks pretty flat, pretty low contrast. I shoot everything as flat as possible. Uh, my camera is set in the Nikon settings to neutral. I don't use Vivid or anything. And since I'm shooting in camera raw, it's going to uh, keep all that information for me. Uh, please bear with me as uh, this tutorial might be a little bit slower as far as loading times because with this D800, these giant 36 megapixel sensors uh, do take up quite a bit of space. Uh, so let's get started here. And so we're going to start, when I go in Lightroom, I usually just start from the top and work my way down. Uh, as far as white balance, I feel it's pretty neutral. I kind of want this to be a little bit colder. So I'm going to, uh, right now it's set to about 4850 Kelvin. Uh, that's pr pretty much where I about want it. I don't want it uh, too cold, but I don't want it warm either. This isn't an inviting pose. So um, this is out of the cameras pretty much where this was shot it was at 4850 so I'm just going to leave it there uh, and I dialed that in manually when I was shooting so that was another setting that I took care of in camera as far as our exposure I'm going to bump it up just a little bit and mind you whenever I play with any slider in Lightroom I'm always being sure to keep an eye on my histogram in the top right corner and because everything I touch I'm going to do in small increments so basically I'm just going to bump up the exposure just a little bit. I think I missed this one just maybe by a tenth of a stop. And I'm one of those type of guys if I'm bumping up more than a half of a stop I probably missed that exposure in the first place and it probably isn't worth shooting or keeping. Uh, as far as contrast I usually don't mess with the contrast too much in Lightroom. I add contrast using curves adjustments or clarity sliders. Uh, but with this one, since I want this to be a very gritty photo, I am going to add just a little bit of contrast to bump it in a little bit. Looking at my histogram here, my blacks aren't quite there. I usually like to just touch my blacks to the bottom. And in this case, we'll leave them where they're at for now. Alright, now coming down to my tonal curve and I'm going to bounce back up here in a minute but I want this to be a contrast image so I have no problem using Lightroom's presets of you know as setting a point curve and set it to strong contrast right off the bat uh, just to get me a ballpark figure of where I want to be from there I'm going to go ahead and play with uh, my tonal curve here just a little bit I want to crush my shadows down a little bit more I kind of want to and I'm keeping an eye on the hood here as I do this. That's probably the blackest part of the photo. And keeping an eye on there. And if you notice, if I go up here and hover over my shadow clipping, I do have just a little bit of clipping there, which is just fine. I don't mind a little bit of clipping. And mind you, I am working in an sRGB workspace, so 
meaning this is not Adobe 98, this is sRGB because most of these images are going to be delivered to an sRGB printer, uh, inkjet, or they're going to be delivered in a web format, which obviously most web browsers will not show Adobe 98, so I'm keeping it in the same uh, gamut and workspace or color space is what my deliverables are going to be. I shot this in sRGB, I'm editing it in sRGB, I'm going to be printing it and delivering it in sRGB. That's always solved my problems for me. So I've lowered my shadows here, I'm going to go up, maybe just bump the darks up just a little bit here, just to kind of bring some of the detail back in his face. Just like that. And if you notice, by doing that we've kind of saturated the whole image and I want this to be kind of cold and edgy so what I love about Lightroom is that we have our vibrant slider which is mostly a, like a vibrate it's basically add saturation without affecting skin tones is the layman's term for it so I want to decrease the saturation on his face to kind of give him that hard edge hardcore guy look so I'm going to start drawing that down maybe about 50 uh, 48. Now that's cold, cooled off the whole image, but I still want there to be some color in the gun, some color in the greens. So I'm going to go ahead now that I've decreased the vibrance, I'm going to increase the saturation, which is going to bring back some of those tones. And a good rule of thumb for me, I usually just dial in uh, the opposite of what I did on the vibrance. So if I did minus 48 clicks on vibrance, I'm going to add 48 to the saturation. So as you can see now, his face is still semi-cold, the camel's still semi-cold, but I've brought a little bit of that color detail back to some of these juniper trees that are behind him. Moving on down on our settings here. Uh, it, this was a really overcast day. We did get some nice blue colors in the background, but obviously with any digital camera, gray skies are our enemy. So we're going to play with that a little bit. So I'm going to go to my luminance tab on my HSL slider and I'm going to start targeting those blues and bringing them down. So I'm going to start drawing those down to see if I can pull out, well one, it's going to pull out some of the color in the scope turrets here and number two, it might bring me just a little bit of detail out of the snow and a little bit more detail out of the sky. There we go, you can see just by dragging that, look at the difference. And you can, well, if I turn it all the way down, you can literally see where my light path went. You can actually see the spill off from my soft boxes. So even if you're, when you're not editing, if you just kind of want to see where your light is and how to help you with your lighting setup, sometimes I'll drag this down just to kind of see where everything, where, where everything was hitting. So let's drag this down. I don't want to go too far. I don't want this to look like a painterly HDR image. That should be about right. The greens look a little bright too, so maybe we'll target the greens a little bit. And if you're never sure what colors there with Lightroom, you always have the pins here. And you can always click on that pin and drag the pin to whatever area you want to play with and it'll uh, consecutively highlight that for you. So that's always a fun little tool to work with too if you're working in an area or in tight areas where you want to target things directly. So that went ahead and darkened that. And then let's go ahead and warm up his face just a little bit and some of the reds. We do got a little bit of red in the trees. Uh, we do have some browns and some reds in this camouflage. And this is a very expensive high-end camel. We want to make sure we highlight that too. Being in mind that the hero of this shot, as I'll quote from Matthew Jordan Smith, is the firearm. We are selling the firearm in this image. We're not selling the hunter, we're not selling the trees, we're not selling the bag, we are selling the gun. So this is going to be the hero of our image and this is what we're going to focus on the entire time. I've increased the luminance of the red and the orange and what that did, it kind of took some of that. If I reset the image here, you can see if I go to his face, it's just a little bit red when I played with the uh, that vibrance and saturation slider. So I'm just going to lighten up his face just ever so slightly. Maybe bring up the orange a little bit too since skin tones are falling in that area. There we go, just like that. And I'll go ahead and turn that off so you can see the difference. 
before and after. You see how, if you look at his face, how we just kind of centered everything right back to him and the firearm. All right. And for this, as I do with most of my images, I do do a little bit of split toning in my photos. And if you haven't played with split toning, the best way to learn it is just to start messing with it and absolutely go to town. So I'm going to go ahead and add just a little bit of a red color, a little bit of warmth to my highlights. This will warm up the camouflage a little bit. And so, and then we'll play with the colors here to see where I can get them right where I want them. Let's see here, kind of a, I don't want to go red and I don't want to go yellow, kind of maybe right in between. That's what I'm looking for. Maybe a little bit more green. Like I said, this is all to taste, so just, I mean, just feel free to play with stuff till you get it looking where you want it. There we go. And with our shadows, I think, I think I'm going to leave my shadows where they at. They kind of already got that, my white balance kind of dictated that in the first place, so that's kind of set up where I want it to. Since we're going to be going into Photoshop here, I'm going to tab on down or scroll on down to the sharpening tab. Sharpening is the last thing you do to any type of image when you're in post-production. So as I'm going to be heading over to Photoshop and coming back into Lightroom, I'm just going to go ahead and turn that off because I don't even want to sharpen until I'm done. As far as the noise reduction, this was shot at ISO 100 on a D800. Uh, the image, the noise on this is absolutely astounding. Virtually no noise in this image. Uh, maybe if I'm a pixel peeper and I zoom into like 300%, I might have just a little bit of uh, luminance noise, lumatic noise. So we'll go ahead and maybe just pull a little bit of that out. Maybe just jump to five real quick. And my color noise, we'll turn that down because I really don't see hardly any of that. And I know on this screen catch you're probably not noticing just due to resolution issues. So, yeah, so about 5 and 10 respectively on my noise reduction. So that looks pretty good. And then uh, a lot of guys just use the highlight of the, the vignette setting just to do oval or, you know, rectangular vignettes. I don't like that. I mostly do a lot of my vignettes. I do custom uh, by using graduated filters, and I'll use tons of them. I'll use five or ten on a photograph, but then I can manually drag where I want it to darken. And here, I'm going to darken the the snow in the foreground. One because I've shot it this way. I left this room here, and so I can add their company logo. I can add website addresses. Do whatever I want. So. Another thing you want to be mindful is that when you're shooting your photographs, be mindful of cropping room. I don't like to throw away pixels, especially if I'm doing commercial work that might be potentially sent to billboard or delivered in large printable formats. And so I'm not even going to crop this image. There's no need to. I'm happy with the crop it is. I got it right in camera. I left all this room in the foreground here on purpose. But since it is deterring from it a little bit, I am going to add my own custom vignetting. And I've made my own little settings here. You can save any presets. So this one, all I did was drop the exposure three quarters of a click down to minus 0 0.75. I went ahead and saved that as a new preset. So whenever I want to use that, I can just literally click on it. So from there, I'm going to drag a graduated filter just to darken up the foreground just a little bit. And even furthermore, I'm going to add a little, I'm going to add one to the top, uh, respectively, to darken the sky a little bit, just to give it a little bit more of a mood. And uh, this tree, we're shooting probably within three feet of this tree. Uh, and with an 85 millimeter focal length, so I was using an 85 1.8, by the way, AFS lens. Uh, there was enough compression there that it did bring the tree a little bit closer than I liked. And so I'm going to go ahead and do a really big filter right here, drag it out so it's really soft, just to kind of bump that tree down. And you can see before and after, before and after, just to kind of bring the highlight back to the firearm and the and the hunter. So, all right, I'm pretty happy with this with these settings here. And so it looks like uh, I've got everything I need. So now I'm going to go ahead and send this guy to Photoshop, where we will. Uh, add some curves adjustments, maybe add some grungy textures to the image. 
So simply right click on it. I'm going to edit in, edit in Photoshop. And we're going to bounce over here as soon as the computer does it. A little bit slow with the D800. It is a pretty large image. All right, we are in Photoshop. First thing I'm going to do as I do with anything, I'm going to do make each setting or change I make is going to be on a new later layer. Control J will duplicate your layer. And I'm going to go in and do any corrections that I need to make. Usually I'll start with skin. And with him being uh, a hardcore type A hunter, there's really not a lot I have to do. So I'm just going to use the spot healing brush here just to kill just to kill a couple of these little guys who what I don't want. Not too bad. A little bit of lightness here in his beard that will take out so it's more congruent. And as you notice here, shooting outside in 20 degree weather, oh, I got a cord in the shot and this D800 is so resilient you can even see the water droplets on it. <laughs> so I just can't speak enough about this D800 and what a wonderful camera it's been. Uh, for most people it might be a little uh, a little bit too many megapixels for most guys but for someone like me it's a commercial photographer and needs uh, resolution and not frames per second it's been a godsend. Uh, definitely a lot funner than having to buy a medium format and I've rented medium formats I've shot campaigns on them uh, the D800 is not a medium format you know compared to some of the Hasselblads and some of the other amazing cameras out there but uh, bane for the buck it gets you pretty damn close so right now I'm just using the spot healing brush tool uh, combined with clone stamp tools and I'm just trying to take out this uh, cord that I had going here and we're zoomed in here quite a bit so I'm not too worried about doing a perfect job on this because it's just going to blend out. Maybe go to our clone stamp tool. S on your keyboard is your shortcut for clone stamp. I've got an oval brush versus a round brush and the reason why I'm using an oval shaped brush is one, round brushes are more uh, they're, con they're symmetrical and more congruent so they're gonna look like it's made a correction if you use an oval brush it's a lot it, it kinda fools the eye a little bit uh, when you're doing your your stamping and uh, other type of corrections and so when I'm cleaning up skin or clone stamping ninety percent of the time I'm gonna just use uh, an oval brush so and this one's pretty soft I don't even care if I get rid of this twig This isn't too great of a job, but for the sake of this tutorial, you can spend more time on your images. Or if you're a great photographer, you'll get it right in camera, not have cords in your shot. In fact, we'll just bump it to 100% and just start filling in these holes with some, with some other foliage and I'm control alt z in constantly if I accidentally click uh, with my tablet something I don't like or don't want to see maybe fill in these holes with the rocks here give it a harder edge We'll turn our opacity back down on our clone stamp tool and maybe just stamp out some of these textures that look rep repetitive. Just like that. Alright, now that that's done, I think all my flaws and corrections have been made. I'm going to go ahead and flatten my layer. If you're getting started with Photoshop, it's a good idea to leave all your layers open so you can see what's going on. But as we are pretty experienced here, we're just going to go ahead and flatten our image. From there, now I'm going to add a texture to the image. And what I have here is some great textures, which I legally purchased from videocopilot.net. Our friend over Andrew Kramer over here does amazing tutorials for After Effects. Uh, he has tons of plugins. I highly recommend visiting their site. Uh, I've pretty much bought most of their 
plugins and stock stock FX that they offer. Um, the plugins I have here today are a mix from Evolution and their Riot Gear packs, and this is a great texture that we can add to our 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 uh, picture here. That's going to help us. So to do that, I'm going to go ahead and open it up. I'm going to float the window here. I'm going to use V to uh, select my selection tool. I'm going to simply just drag it over into my new project. Uh, this is telling me, it's throwing a thing saying here that this is an 8-bit uh, texture and I have a 16-bit image. Yes, I'm okay with it. So yes, I'm going to proceed. So our texture has now been added to our image and I'm simply going to rotate it. Uh, if it's not highlighted up front, Control T will go ahead and get that so you can transform it however you want. I'm going to go ahead and scale it to the bounds of my picture. And I know we're scaling it up quite a bit, but we're going to be putting in a low mode you won't see it. And it's going to bicubically resample this texture so it matches just fine. So now our texture is on top of our image. We've added it. Now we need to go to our layer style. And we're going to play with uh, overlay or even soft light. There, I like soft light. That looks pretty good. Control T again will let me transform it. And I'm going to rotate it around. And if you want to rotate uh, in perfect uh, 50 degree increments, uh, go, ho go ahead and hold Shift as you rotate, and that way you can get it perfectly level. So. That looks pretty good like that. I liked it rotated. Maybe flip it back around. That gives me a darker sky but lighter snow. Maybe put the dark side on the snow. I like that. Alright, there we go. And maybe I'll play with the opacity a little bit here. And whenever I do opacity changes, I never make drastic changes. I don't go 0 to 100. I'll start at 0 and I'll slowly, maybe 10% at a time, gradually ramp it up to where I want it to be. There we go. About 80% looks pretty good. Now again, the hero or the highlight of this image is the firearm. And so uh, this firearm has a very expensive, very fancy carbon fiber based uh, stock. And I really don't want this grungy texture covering the gun or the, the scope or even the hunter's face. So what we're gonna go we're gonna go ahead and add a layer mask to this. Down on the right corner you'll see your layer mask tool. Looks like a square with a circle in it. And you'll see your white mask here. From there I'm gonna select a brush, hitting B on your keyboard. Uh, I've got a nice soft brush, select whatever size you want. You can always increase your brush size by using left or right bracket keys. I've gone ahead and turned the opacity down on my brush to about 50% because uh, I don't want to pull the texture away all at once and if I, I can gradually erase it as I want. I've also turned the flow of my brush down a little bit too. So now by painting a black colored brush on the white layer mask it's going to go ahead and subtract the texture from this layer. So I'm going to go ahead and pull all the texture, all that grunginess from this stock because I don't want it on there. And mind you I am using a soft brush, I am using a tablet and I do have tablet pressure pushed on so just because we do have some feathering going on with the soft brush, I am going ahead and using a pretty small brush just to make sure the feathering does not go outside of the borders that I want, meaning the scope, because I don't want it to hit the trees or anything, because then it will look like I've got kind of a, an aura or a halo around whatever I'm erasing. So, slowly going ahead and erasing this, lifting my pen, putting it back down to make sure I'm covering my tracks. I'll even open the history tool so you can see that I am constantly lifting my brush. When you first start using your tablet you might find yourself never lifting your brush and doing complete erasing jobs using one giant stroke. Well the problem is if you mess up and you have to step back a turn it's going to take everything away. So.
taking my time. I'm going to zoom way in here because we want to make sure we get the grunginess off the barrel, so to speak. Got this beautiful match grade fluted barrel. Custom bluing on it. And I'm just slowly working my way, lifting my pen. 55% opacity brush, flown at about 85%, so it doesn't quite. And you can tailor that to whatever you want on the flow. I rarely use 100% flow. In a lot of cases, I'll usually use even less than 50%. Uh, me, as a classically trained artist, meaning I used to draw on paint quite a bit, I'm used to having a pretty light touch. So, All right, so there is the barrel. Scope looks pretty good. Maybe pull a little bit more out of the stock here. And now we're going to tackle his face. Don't want to look like he has skin peeling off or smallpox or something, so we'll go ahead and pull, pull our uh, grittiness off of him. Maybe just a little bit off the hat here, too. Whatever you want. This is Bob Ross to say, it's your world. You can put whatever you want in it. All right, so it's looking pretty good now. We'll zoom back out, and you can see our picture is coming together. Uh, we have gone uh, from Lightroom into Photoshop. We've added a grungy texture. And from there, we're going to do our final tweaks to this image, in which we are going to add a curves adjustment layer. A lot of people want to know how I get my looks. Every image I touch has curves adjusted to it. To add a curves adjustment layer, we are simply going to go to my adjustment layer tab and click on curves. And again, I'm adding an adjustment layer. I'm not going to image adjustments curves because in that case, it's going to add a curves which you can't really mess with because it's going to add it to that layer of your picture or your background or duplicated layer versus an adjustment layer. So make sure you are doing an adjustment layer, not an adjustment itself or a proprietary adjustment to your image. So whenever I start with curves, especially when I'm doing lamography and some cross-processing, which I'm going to do just a little bit here, um, I'm always going to start with my blue channel uh, finish with my green regarding my chroma and then jump to my RGB for final contrast. So I'm going to start with my blue channel and to work on this I think I'm going to crush them maybe just a little bit. You know I don't want to go too much but I'm going to crush the blue so the blacks are just coming a little bit more bluer and I'm going to kind of Get, get this a little bit colder. I'm mean, going to make these shadows even a little bit more colder than what they are. So Maybe add just a little bit of blue to it. Now I don't want the skin tones or the highlights to be blue. I want them to still be warm and camel-like and a little bit of green. So I'm going to go up to my highlights here and maybe bring them back down. This is very finesse. I mean, you, you tweak this till it looks right. From there, I'm going to jump over to my red channel. That's the second I'm going to use. And I'm going to go ahead and eh, maybe I, I could crush them a little bit if I wanted a little bit of a Red Dawn type of look or Rescue Dawn type of deal. So I'm going to leave those down. However, I am going to lower, I'm going to, by making it more, I'm going to make it more green and blue in my shadows by simply lowering the reds and the shadows just ever so slightly. I want to bring some color back to the highlights so I'm going to do raise the highlights so basically I'm doing an S curve on this a very very slight S curve just ever so slightly. That looks pretty good skin tones are looking good on my calibrated monitor and finally, to balance everything, I use the green. The green I call the balancer. Red and blue give it the look. Green finalizes or balances your look. So to do that, I'm going to... It's a little bit red in the highlight, so maybe just add a little bit green to neutralize that. 
just ever so slightly. Maybe a little bit in the shadows too. There, that looks pretty good. So you can see a before and after of what we're getting with this. You can see how we are crushing our blacks up to the blue side. And we're adding a little bit of a blue-green tone to the entire image as a whole. Again, before and after. Now, uh, we'll go ahead and open that back up. And we'll go, now that we've got our blue, red, and lastly, green channels selected and put where we want them, we'll go to our RGB channel, which is going to adjust all of them. And I'm going to maybe just crush the blacks up maybe just a little bit more as a whole. Maybe not, I'll leave them down. And I'm going to add just a little bit more contrast image by giving it a slight, an ever so slight S-curve. And all this time, I'm going to go ahead and refresh my histogram on my curves, refresh my histogram up at the top. In Photoshop, rather than having the navigator window open, I usually have a histogram open because it is the all-important key to your whole image. And so to make sure I'm not clipping anything, especially if you're shooting brides or anything in a white dress, or in our case, white snow, you want to make sure we're not clipping anything and with digital photography and digital camera sensors you're exposing for the highlights versus film photography where we're exposing for the shadows and so we are being mindful and weary all the time a little bit too much here and I'm just gonna get this right where I want it there that looks pretty good maybe one more adjustment He's a little bit red still to me. There we go. There is our image that we have done in Photoshop. Simply with three or four layers. We'll go ahead and look at the start of this. There's our image straight from Lightroom. And then our finalized image here in Photoshop looks pretty good I'm gonna go ahead and flatten my flatten my image I'm gonna go ahead and save it control or command s and close our image control or command w we will tab back over to Lightroom and Lightroom now has our images imported I'm gonna go ahead and set my brand new TIFF edited TIFF file as green Go ahead and set my original one that I was playing with yellow. If you want to do one or four or five stars, whatever color you want, this is just the system I use. And from there, I'm going to go ahead and do my final touches to this image, and that's going to be sharpening. Uh, to give this the final grittiness that I want, I'm going to go ahead and bump the clarity slider up ever so slightly. Don't want to go overboard, but maybe... Maybe about 36. That looks pretty good. Take a look, zoom in here so we can see how that looks. Pretty good. And then we will go ahead and sharpen our image by using Lightroom's built in preset. I'm just going to hit sharpen faces. A little bit too much, maybe. So I'll scroll down here to the sharpening window. By holding in Alt or Shift, you can change how you view your image by holding alt and clicking the masking you can see an alpha channel of what you're sharpening so I'll go ahead and mask that off a little bit more same with the radius tool detail levels maybe just turn down the sharpening just a little bit there we go it looks pretty good. And one thing I did forget to do in Photoshop, I wanted to lighten his eye a little bit uh, by just using a little bit of white. And again, I'm not going for Edward eyes. Please, guys, quit. Especially on models, I'm seeing guys with glamour shots here flipping, making their eyes burning amber colors by dodging the hell out of the irises. That's cool as an artist, but honestly, in real life, people don't look like that unless you are Bella or Edward. 
So in regards to that, I'm going to just use Lightroom's cool tool, which we can introduce here, by going to Iris Enhance, which is a nice plug-in under the adjustment brush. I believe they started this with Lightroom 3 and newer. Basically, it bumps up. It's an exposure adjustment, a clarity adjustment, and a saturation adjustment. So we'll see how that looks here. Just go in here and paint over his eye ever so slightly. There we go. Perfect. From far away, it just gives him a little bit highlight to his eye. So that is the tutorial for today. You can see how we went from our original image to our finished image. And so, not too shabby for this. If you have any questions, you can email them to me at bigben at btsphotography.com or leave a politically correct and responsible comment below. I look forward to seeing you again, and I bid you happy shooting and even happier editing. And if I have to remind you of one thing, that is to get it right in the camera, not in Photoshop. I'm Big Ben, and have a good day.